Good, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our event, A Fair and Effective Tax System. My name is Fernanda Trescenti, and I serve as the Vice Chair and Events Coordinator for the Australian Fabians Victoria Branch. Taxation. Taxation, um, often viewed as a financial necessity, is also a cornerstone of social justice. The structure of a tax system carries profound impl implications for fairness, equality, and the common good. It is instrumental in funding essential services and redistribu redistributing resources, bridging the gap between the privileged and the less fortunate. As such, Tax, our tax system should reflect our aspirations for a more just society. But does it? Tonight, we are privileged to hear from two distinguished experts, David Richardson and Frank Stilwell. David Richardson is a senior researcher at the Australia Institute with research in interests spanning microeconomics and international economics. David has lent his expertise to parliamentary committees and various economic issues and served during the Hawke Keating governments under ministers Brian Hawke and Senator Nick Bocuse. Frank Stilwell is a well-known advocate of alternative economic strategies that prioritize social justice and ecological sustainability. With over 40 years of teaching experience at the University of Sydney, he remains active as a researcher, writer, editor, and public speaker. And, a, and um, uh, our one of our favorite um, speakers here for the Fabians. Um, this is an opportunity for us to deepen our understanding, challenge our preconceptions, and contemplate what a taxation system that truly reflects our principles of equity and justice would look like. So I would like to thank and welcome our speakers. And uh, I believe David's gonna start, is that it? Yes, so uh, yes. please David. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honour to be invited to talk to the Fabian Society and, and appear with uh, Frank Stilwell. Um, <clears throat> Frank and I have known each other for a little while now, and uh, he's one of the great researchers on the progressive side of politics in Australia. Um, <clears throat> Tax reform has been in the air and uh, uh, the main event that's happened recently <clears throat> is that the stage three tax cuts that were designed to go to the rich have been ditched. People were saying that was impossible, it's written into the law, the government said they're going to, uh, <clears throat> uh, going to maintain them uh, and a lot of people were feeling depressed about uh, the forthcoming uh, gift of billions of dollars to the top end of town. But since they've been ditched, people seem to be a little bit freer to talk about tax alternatives. Uh, we're seeing more on um, uh, strengthening, for example, taxes on resources in Australia. The petroleum resource rent tax has been woefully inadequate compared with other countries. Um, and uh, uh, our CEO at the Institute, Richard Dennis, has made the point that the petroleum resource rent tax collects from the, uh, the booming gas sector less than what students repay in HECS every year. 
sort of uh, tells you about our priorities, doesn't it? The tax reform, uh, most of what we read in the press are the neoliberal versions, um, <clears throat> variations of what we used to call trickle-down theory. Uh, and these are as old as the hills. Remember Galbraith uh, <clears throat> beautifully summarizing trickle down with the analogy of when he was growing up on the farm. Birds in the area uh, where he grew up, a particular type of bird used to pick through the dung of the draft horses. Uh, searching for undigested bits of grain. Uh, a beautiful analogy for trickle-down theory. <clears throat> but <clears throat> what I want to concentrate on tonight is capital gains and their impact on, on income and wealth. Um, <clears throat> just a quick definition. By capital gains, I'm referring to the increase in a capital assets value. It might be a house, a farm, a painting, whatever, uh, but these are assets belonging to people. I'm going to be concentrating on the household sector. Uh, and I note that mainstream pretty well ignores capital gains and its interaction with wealth in Australia. We almost never discuss whether capital gains are adequately ta taxed. And um, <clears throat> to whet your appetite, capital gains are the hidden factor driving masses, uh, massive increases in wealth for the rich. And <clears throat> uh, they're running at a trend value of almost half household income as it's con conventionally measured. And if present trends continue, uh, capital gains for the rich are going to be worth all the other wages, rent, interest income, all the other things that households receive and that go into conventional measures of income. Um, almost everything you read, uh, all the data collected by the ABS, for example, ignores capital gains. <clears throat> uh, I like to think of them as the dark matter of Australia's tax debate. Capital gains are unseen, but play a massive role. Um, <clears throat> now... <clears throat> Yes, wealth is very unequal, but uh, uh, that too is almost never discussed in the present tax debate. Um, <clears throat> there's a perhaps a feeling that there's little we can do about it, and most people are unaffected by it. Um, <clears throat> but poverty, cost of living crisis, and the worsening wealth distribution are in many ways just the flip side of each other. Um, I, when I talk about wealth and capital gains and stuff in more detail, it may seem a bit clinical, uh, but these, these things, the wealth of the top end of town clearly affects uh, the plight of ordinary Australians the poor and the, and the middle classes I only have to mention housing denied to the lower income and the younger age groups, uh, but constitute a big part of household wealth concentrated at the top end. Um, <clears throat> and you can't mention that at the moment without mentioning Alison Pennington's terrific book, um, uh, Generation Am I allowed to say it? Yeah. Uh, generation fucked. Uh, the houses young people can't afford are part of the net worth held by the top end of town. 
Um, <clears throat> but back to the main argument, uh, the figures show that the income distribution in Australia is unequal, but the distribution of wealth is even more unequal. Um, <clears throat> we, we use equivalised data from the ABS. This adjusts raw household figures for the size of the household and its composition. And <clears throat> for household income, the top 20% by income have income averaging five and a bit times the bottom 20%. But for wealth, the top 20 wealthiest have uh, 154 times the bottom 20%. Now, <clears throat> spoiler alert, but you can see if all the wealth is concentrated at the top end, then any capital gains are going to uh, accrue to the top end and make the earlier figure that I quoted look rather silly. Uh, <clears throat> instead of the top incomes being five and a bit times the bottom, they're going to be much more. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the, the link between capital gains and wealth is very important. Income is a flow of a time and think of wages coming in weekly or fortnightly uh, as, a, as do other incomes. But wealth is a stock, as I said, comprising assets like houses, yachts, financial assets like shares and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and while people can increase their wealth as they save out of their incomes, this is the thing that people tend to focus on, qualitatively, uh, quantitatively, much more important are the increases in wealth that come from capital gains. I like to use the, the analogy of the bathtub. Uh, and if you remember nothing else from what I say tonight, uh, I'd like you to remember the bathtub, adding water, the flow adds to the stock, the level of the water. And there are two flows going into the bathtub, the savings flow and capital gains. So we have a savings tap and a capital gains tap. Now, <clears throat> based on ABS data, uh, capital gains have been adding on average an additional 43% to household incomes uh, over the uh, recent decade. Um, but as I said, mo most households have little wealth and so get little income through this channel. And uh, <clears throat> it follows that the wealthiest households are, are receiving enormous amounts now, the total last calendar year, capital gains were around $1 billion. That's a massive flow that increased the stock of capital to around 15,000 billion. And meanwhile, uh, last calendar year, household savings out of conventionally defined income were in round numbers, zero. So, that the savings tap is hardly working at the moment. Household wealth is being uh, increased massively and it's mainly due to capital gains on outstanding wealth. And <clears throat> we make the point, um, <clears throat> uh, some of this, this talk tonight refers to the paper that Frank and I have in the, uh, the December issue of this, the Journal of Australian Political Economy. We make the point there that capital gains should be treated as ordinary income. Um, <clears throat> uh, I mentioned before that the top 20% of our households uh, had about five times 
uh, more uh, income than the bottom 20% as conventionally measured. But for capital gains, the equivalent ratio was 108 to 1. And capital gains boosted the income of the bottom 20%, uh, <clears throat> boosted their income by about 4%, uh, <clears throat> just to interrupt for a second though when we're talking about low income people with capital gains uh, we're likely to be talking about those that manage to disguise pretty well all their cash income uh, and appear in the bottom 20 percent sort of artificially as a result of tax avoidance but <clears throat> Uh, capital gains then, uh, on our estimates, boosted the income of the top 20% by a massive 144%. So uh, while capital gains are around half total household income, for the top 20%, uh, you can see that they're... Um, <clears throat> Uh, 1.44 times total income. We also asked, you know, what are the what are these trends, and what happens if they continue in, into the future? Um, <clears throat> looking at all the figures that the ABS publishes on this, going back to September '89, uh, we found that wealth increased by a compound 7.3 percent per annum compared with household income that increased by 5.4%. Now, <clears throat> over the same time, inflation averaged only 2.7%. So uh, wealth is increasing much more rapidly than the price level, for example, and much more rapidly than total income. So, <clears throat> Uh, we don't want to say these trends are definitely continue into the future. I hope something happens to stop them. But if they don't, then the ratio of wealth to household income in Australia will increase from 7.5 times at the moment to 15.6 by the 2060s. This is doing a sort of a 40-year intergeneration report similar to what the government publishes now and again. Uh, and by that time, instead of being roughly half household incomes, capital gains will be 1.1 times household income. And we think <clears throat> uh, that <clears throat> the trends are so strong and going to become apparent to everyone in the not too distant future, hopefully, uh, that something is going to have to happen. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, Thomas Piketty mentioned in his smash hit book, Capital in the 21st Century, is that if the increase in society's wealth exceeds the growth in national income, then wealth becomes more concentrated and family dynasties tend to loom large relative to the size of the economy. And that seems to be happening in Australia. And the pro process, of course, gets a turbo boost when capital gains are added into the, the forces that increase wealth. Uh, <clears throat> some summarising to this point, Wealth and capital gains are very important, very much more important than income, as usually understood, uh, when we consider the nature and sources of social inequality. Second, achieving a more sustainable and equitable set of tax arrangements requires putting a strong focus on wealth and capital gains. And third, wealth and capital gains need to be focal points for the tax reform. <clears throat> um, 
Now, uh, in the time I've got left, I want to just compare the views that we've I've put out so far with uh, the major um, government report on tax reform uh, was the 2010 report by Treasury Secretary Ken Henry uh, to the Rudd government. Now, this argued uh, that income derived from capital should be taxed only lightly. And this reflected a quaint view that wealth is accumulated by hardworking people who are thrifty and saving for their retirement and saving for other contingencies. And of course, many, many people do this. But the official data shows that household savings coming from wage and other incomes are just a tiny part of the growth in the wealth. Uh, as traditionally defined, household savings out of the traditional measures of income accounted for only 10% 10, 10 of the increase in household wealth since uh, 1989. So <clears throat> we can think of the two taps going into the bathtub. Uh, conventional savings, 10.4% uh, of of the total flow so that uh, capital gains are almost 10 times as much of uh, are flowing at almost 10 times as much as the flow from savings. Um, <clears throat> but also, uh, you know, the, the view of Ken Henry that it's household savings driving capital accumulation and driving wealth and these, uh, this savings has already been taxed uh, when it was first received by the wage earner or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and so it should be lightly taxed uh, because, you know, we depend on this uh, for our <clears throat> accumulation of capital in Australia. Uh, but even though it's only 10% of household income. Um, <clears throat> household savings are, are less than 20% of total savings in Australia anyway. The rest is largely due to the corporate sector, the banking system, and government business enterprises. And sometimes uh, governments making a surplus on current transactions. Anyway, uh, so Henry's vision is that we should tax capital lightly uh, because of that argument that we're taxing the same thing twice. Uh, once in, in the hands of the, um, uh, the person receiving uh, after tax money. And uh, secondly, when people earn an income on that, uh, on their savings. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to end on a plea that uh, um, <clears throat> by ignoring capital gains and the failure to tax wealth, discussions about tax reform are narrowly focused. Uh, <clears throat> And so most of the discussion we have is largely confined to wages do dominating and a bit of self-employment, unincorporated business income. Um, but generally, you know, the argument tends to be on how, how much we should tax income uh, versus consumption, this sort of thing that affects the household sector. But <clears throat> completely ignores capital gains and wealth that are driving inequality 
and doing so much damage to Australia. Well, thanks. I think I'll leave it there. If um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, we have I have here a whole lot of questions that were made as you were um, speaking, but we will first listen to, um, to Frank and then we'll start the Q&A. So Frank, please be welcome. Thank you, Fernanda. That's great. And uh, I was very interested in David's remarks. I mean, he's been a great researcher at the Australia Institute and the way in which he's put together the facts and figures on this matter are, are enormously impressive. And uh, the question is that I want to address is how do we use that kind of analysis to actually intervene in debates about tax? What should we be pushing for? What obstacles will we confront? And what ultimately is, is, is the prospects for achieving uh, a progressive outcome? Of the sort that you know, the Fabian society would normally want to see in any tax system. I mean, normally discussions of tax systems are about uh, the potency of the tax system, you know, its capacity to generate sufficient revenue, yeah. to uh, pay for the array of uh, services that governments provide, the infrastructure that they build, the various expenditures that we need as a society undertaken collectively through government and government agencies. Uh, Secondly, the, the, the question is always, are they efficient taxes? Um, and this is often interpreted by economists rather narrowly uh, in terms of whether or not they create adverse disincentives for work, for example. Some people say that income taxes are vulnerable to the charge, although, frankly, the evidence is rather weak because uh, if, you, if you've got a high tax, you've simply got to work more in order to, to foot that bill. So the sense that which uh, taxes on income from employment uh, are thought to be a disincentive is shaky grounds. But nonetheless, in more general terms, we do want our tax system to be potent, we want it to be efficient, and we want it to be equitable. Now, that, of course, the crunch issue in this case, uh, was certainly the crunch issue, crunch issue in revising the stage three income tax cuts. Uh, Albo and co uh, clearly sensed that uh, it was going to be terribly inequitable to persist with the original stage three formulation. They've uh, made it more equitable, although frankly, even under the revised version of the stage three income tax cuts, the biggest beneficiaries are the, are the, the high income earners. They get all the benefits of, of the low to middle income earners plus uh, more at, at the top. And indeed, that's often the case in tax reform. Yeah. If, if you raise, for example, the tax-free threshold to benefit really low income earners, well, the high income earners benefit from that too because that's more of their income uh, that is not being taxed at all. So... Um, Getting the balance right here in terms of uh, an income tax system that's potent, that's efficient and equitable is really um, crucial. So how's this going to be achieved? Well, more focus on wealth is Dave's position and it's one with which I strongly agree. Um, wealth is becoming more concentrated uh, than, than incomes. Uh, indeed, the official figures measured, for example, by the Gini coefficient suggest that wealth is twice as concentrated among house, Australian households than, than is incomes. And at the top end, uh, asset ownership uh, rather than work has been the key to the growing uh, wealth accumulation process. This is what is sometimes called the asset economy a society in which ownership um, of assets is a more important determinant of your position in society than even the job you do. Sure, uh, surgeons and lawyers 
earn more than uh, builders, laborers, and garbage collectors. That nothing much has changed on that front. But it's the capacity of people with high incomes to accumulate assets, the increase of value of which through inflationary processes means yet more income flows to those already wealthy people. And that's that's the problem, not just in terms of abstract concepts of equity in society, but in terms of housing, for example. I mean, we, we, we're told there's a housing affordability crisis. Well, some are doing very nicely out of the current housing situation. People who own large, valuable properties, particularly people who own strings of properties that they uh, use for, uh, for rental, um, come, rents are rising rapidly, but it also generates capital accumulation over time. And uh, that in itself creates more difficulties for people getting into home ownership in the first place. So uh, housing wealth and housing unaffordability are, in this case, two sides of the same coin. And that's true, I think, when you trace through many aspects of contemporary Australian society. And indeed, not just Australia. Uh, international studies comparing different countries with different levels of inequality show a markedly different incidence of social problems. Indeed, I think it's fair to say on the basis of this evidence uh, generated by epidemiologists like Richard Wilkinson, Kate Pickett, uh, Danny Dawling, a, a British social scientist, they put together all this data and I summarise it in, in my book on the political economy of inequality, which shows that the more unequal societies are in general societies with higher crime rates, uh, a greater instance of violence, uh, including domestic violence, um, poorer physical and mental health, higher levels of obesity, poorer educational achievements in general across the board, and very importantly, lower levels of social mobility. In other words, as the gap between rich and poor widens, the capacity to achieve equality of opportunity shrinks. Uh, you know, increasingly, uh, one's position in society is determined by the circumstances into which you're born. Reminding us, of course, as, as always, it's the most important choice any of us ever make is to choose our parents wisely. Well, of course, that's the one choice that none of us ever get to make, but uh, it is the most crucial determinant of uh, the opportunities that they're then open to you as you move further through society. And to hop back to the housing issue, uh, well, of course, it's the bank of mum and dad that enables some uh, younger people, albeit on modest incomes, to attain higher ownership, whereas the lack of access to uh, uh, parents who can help out in this process uh, makes for such greater difficulty for other young people who may actually be of similar economic status, similar uh, earning power in their wage income, but just can't break through into the home ownership process. In summary, doing something about this is absolutely crucial. It's not just important because of a general commitment to equality of opportunity. It's crucially important if, to tackle this asset economy phenomenon if we're going to create a society in which uh, there's more affordable housing for all, uh, in which there's better health, education outcomes, and importantly, better environmental outcomes. Because lo and behold, it also turns out from this international comparative evidence that the countries with the highest inequality, the things being equal, tend to be the countries in which the ecological footprint is largest. In other words, do the most damage to the environment through climate change and uh, other forms of environmental stress. So this is a huge challenge. How is it to be dealt with? 
Um, if we to refocus the tax system on uh, questions of wealth, capital gains, uh, there are essentially three avenues. One is direct taxation of wealth. Now, this happens to some extent already, but only particular items of wealth. For example, land tax is a tax on the holding of wealth in the form of land. I think very important and could be extended further. But Thomas Piketty, the, the, the leading international researcher in this field, advocates a more general tax on wealth, an annual tax that, for example, in the Australian case, might be, say, 2% on the total value of a household's wealth in excess of, say, 2 or $3 million, which would exempt uh, from any form of wealth tax broad swathe of Australian society and ensure that it's focused on people with wealthy homes, substantial holdings of uh, shares and other financial assets. Yes, that would be equitable. It would be controversial and uh, it would work best as a global tax. But frankly, the chance of getting the agreement that uh, that Piketty envisages on a global scale to implement such a wealth tax and use some of the proceeds to help the poorer countries with development processes is, is rather remote. I think we have to focus first and foremost on getting our own house in order. And there, there's a much more obvious mechanism for doing so. That's getting rid of the 50% discount on capital gains that is uh, currently permissible in respect of capital gains taxation. Yes, we do have tax on capital gains. When capital gains are realized through the sale of an asset and the uh, person achieve, uh, receiving that income is able to uh, get a discount of 50%. In other words, Income from capital gains is taxed at only half of the rate of income from labour. Now, this, frankly, if you th if you think about it from abstract principles of what what is equitable, what is efficient, what is potent in taxation arrangements, this is completely anomalous. It was John Howard's move to halve the capital gains tax uh, through introducing this 50% discount. It's got to go. There's, there's no two ways about it. As, as Paul Keating used to argue when he was treasurer in the Hawke government, it is obviously unfair to tax income from capital at only half the rate of income from labor. Think about it. Income from capital comes to just reaping in the benefits of inflationary processes. Income from labor comes through hard yakka. Why would the former be taxed more lightly than the latter? You would expect any decent labor government to come and correct this anomaly. But there's a third thing, in addition to an across-the-board wealth tax or uh, more effective capital gains taxation, there is, of course, inheritance tax. Ah, the death tax looms. Yes, this is uh, a very politically contentious issue. But remember, Australia used to have taxes on inheritance until the reactionary Queensland Premier, Joe Bjorki peterson abolished the taxes that applied in that state, because for the most part, they were state taxes rather than Commonwealth taxes. But Malcolm Fraser, who was Prime Minister of Australia at that time, uh, abolished the federal uh, inheritance tax, and all the other state premiers followed suit such that since the 1980s, there's been no inheritance taxation in Australia. Now, think about that again in terms of economic and uh, ethical rationale. Um, 
there's a lot of income foregone because an effective inheritance tax, which exists in many other countries, can generate quite a lot of revenue at the time the wealth is transferred, typically transferred intergenerationally from parents to their children or grandchildren. And uh, there's a pretty clear logic in having such a tax, not just as a source of revenue, but uh, again, on, on ethical grounds, that um, one can hardly say in any general sense that receiving a legacy from a deceased person, such as a parent or grandparent, uh, has any bearing on your productivity. It, there's no incentive or disincentive effects here, other than perhaps cozy to one's grandparents and uh, that making sure they're in, in their good books. But uh, uh, the logic of this chain of reasoning is that taxing the transfer of wealth at the moment of inheritance would be... Uh, no disincentive effects for, on labour, no adverse impacts on productivity, but would ensure that we could more readily achieve equality of opportunity and intergenerational equity. Now, that phrase, of course, keeps cropping up in the debates around housing. It's so much tougher to become a homeowner now. Well, if you're the... Uh, son, daughter, or grandchild of uh, a homeowner, chance you might get the inheritance. Quite likely it, it's going to be too late anyway, because uh, given the age at which people die these days, those legacies often go to people who are already in their 60s uh, or thereabouts, uh, by which time they're probably their housing situation is already fairly well sorted out. So the effect of the legacy is simply to give more to those who probably already got uh, quite adequate incomes and, and, and be indeed personal wealth themselves. So the logic of, of this, it seems to me, uh, is almost inescapable. Yes, you need effective inheritance taxation to, in, to ensure that the intergenerational transfer of wealth does not accentuate intergenerational inequities and, and class inequities within generations at, at the same time. But of course, we remember that uh, you know this has been a political hot potato in the past, and there's all sorts of uh, scare campaigns that can be produced around this issue, uh, as they were, of course, in the uh, 2019 federal election, when Bill Shorten dared to talk about winding up negative gearing. Uh, uh, which uh, is a policy that gives greatest advantage to multiple owners. And uh, getting rid of that capital gains tax discount. And, of course, the, uh, the scare campaign mounted by the Conservative coalition at the time also said they're going to move on death duties. So, you know, they weren't, but... Uh, just the mere mention of the prospect of a death tax, you know, is uh, sufficiently scary that uh, that apparently played into the hands of an unscrupulous opposition willing to whip up the maximum scare campaign around the, uh, the Labour proposals under the leadership of Bill Shorten. And here, of course, we come to the, the current situation. Has Labour the courage to rerun that kind of tax reform agenda? I personally doubt it. Um, I'm very pleased, of course, that the, uh, that the tax three, tax, stage three income tax cuts revisions have occurred. And I hope that Albo and Co have learned the lesson that you can make changes to taxation which are seen as necessary and are likely to be 
electorally popular. In other words, producing reforms which give the major benefits to the people in society who are really struggling is a good idea. And that's all that's really involved in re-embracing this agenda. Now, clearly the Albo government is not going to do this in its first term, but this is a government that's looking forward and indeed striving towards having a second term and probably a third. And over that period of time, it is certainly possible that these sort of changes could be brought in. Uh, I, I don't have a, 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 a direct line to Anthony Albanese, so I have no idea what he, Jim Chalmers and the others are cooking up as the possible things that they're going to take to the next uh, federal election. But you would have to be considering what tax reform here is feasible in the pursuit of labour values, which include, of course, a more fair society and, I think, addressing this asset economy phenomenon that is proving to be so problematic in, in the housing field too. So I think one thing that would, I think, help a lot in selling this policy, not at the, probably at the next election, but during the next term of government, if they're capable of achieving it, is linking tax reform to a review of expenditure. Because after all, in the popular mind, the, the main reason for taxes is to pay for government infrastructure, spending, services and so forth. I mean, if we want more of those good things, we need to do more tax paying. Uh, and broadening the tax base in the way that deals with capital gains tax and wealth would do that. So if you can talk about the way in which education system can be improved, free tertiary education, the sort that Goffman introduced, if you can talk about bringing dental treatment into the national health system, if you can talk about ways in which government expenditure can be better targeted to achieve public benefits, even possibly down the track, a job guarantee, a paid, uh, you know, guaranteed work in public sector jobs, or a basic income that's not necessarily uh, linked to one's um, current employment status. Yeah, all of these things uh, could be possible with a more progressive and potent tax system funding um, specific improvements that would benefit the society as a whole. And of course, the transition to a renewable economy, uh, one that's sustainable, renewable energies, uh, and so forth. There's, there's a big agenda for public spending uh, out there if we only get a progressive reform tax system. So I would say we need not just a rerun of that Henry review that was held to more than a decade ago uh, under the Rudd government. We need a broader review of government spending and taxing in order to get this one right. I look forward to the discussion on these uh, very important points. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you so much, David. Yes, the I have a lot of questions here. So I'm gonna try to, I like to pass the word letter, um, some guests speak, but I'm going to combine a few questions as well from um, a few people. So I will start here with inheritance tax. Uh, there was a few questions about that. So um, Linda was saying that um, she she needed the inheritance. That was the way she got to buy a house to to make a deposit for a house and help her daughter. Uh, 
make a deposit. And then other people talking about the threshold that this inheritance tax would have. So those were, um, and another question related to that was if it would be bad, if it wouldn't be best to tax people in life, a wealth tax rather than in the transfer. So I come from Brazil and in Brazil, we do have a um, inheritance tax. It's a low one, it's 4% uh, and uh, it's about to go to 8% next year, right? So it's an inheritance and gift tax. And uh, it's interesting how the um, people just get used to it. For me, it's just so common because I always knew there was one. I didn't even know there were countries that didn't have them. And now here in Australia, people are just so used it, comfortable of not having that this discussion becomes difficult. But in this context, with the also with the person that asked it about the wealth tax in wealth tax in life, wouldn't that be best because uh, really rich people put their assets in a trust, in a discretionary trust or a hybrid with trust and then there isn't really a transfer of wealth when they die because you know it is already in the trust and their kids only receive the benefits of it i don't know so a lot is a lot to talk about inheritance tax <laughs> Yeah, um... if I could just, just just briefly comment first that uh, you know yeah I I think uh, moving on trusts is actually something that will be much more readily achieved by the uh, the Labour government. Um, it's already talked about some areas of tax reform that it's interested in. It's, you know, multi getting more tax out of multinational corporations doing a little changes to superannuation so that the tax relief for superannuation doesn't apply so generously if you've already got more than $3 million in, in, your, in your super fund. Uh, so the government is willing to do those kind of things. And I think uh, a review of trusts, how they can be tied up so they're not used for tax evasion purposes or tax avoidance purposes, I should probably say, um, would be uh, quite a reasonable first step. Yeah, it's interesting with trusts. Uh, I mean, historically, these were used when people tended to die much earlier. And they are a mechanism for looking after dependent children. Uh, but we've grown them into monsters. And it's interesting, too. They're only a creature of the Anglo-Saxon uh, common law system. Um, uh, apparently, most of Europe doesn't have anything like this. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the, the way to do it, uh, I'm told, um, <clears throat> if there's a criminal matter or whatever, uh, the court will ignore any trust arrangements and look behind the trust uh, to see what's really going on. If the tax office had the similar power, uh, then any attempt to avoid through trust uh, could, could be easily overcome. Um, and... Uh, <clears throat> That and other avenues, um, <clears throat> inheritance tax, I 100% agree with uh, what both of you said. Um, <clears throat> it's important when uh, the tax is being, uh, when the wealth is being transferred. Um, there's a quote that Frank and I use that I like. Uh, <clears throat> with inheritance tax, you're taking money away from somebody that doesn't need it anymore uh, uh, and only depriving those who aren't used to it. Um, <clears throat> What kind of threshold then um, would be a good one? Because 
uh, it would definitely yeah. be political suicide if uh, if someone and, and probably not even fair to you know tax people that are transferring a small inheritance or relatively small inheritance so i think it, the the best thing is to what kind of threshold would be a good one uh well i think we've been talking in rough figures of about a million maybe uh, more maybe more yeah. maybe two even three if if that uh, makes it more politically palatable of course yeah. if you don't yeah. index it over time then uh, it would capture more and more uh, yeah. Uh, estates uh, at, at the time of passing. But, yeah. Um, uh, I would have thought two, two to three would make it a much more politically saleable uh, threshold level because it would allow the average family home to be passed on without the tax person taking any slice. Yeah, that's true. Um, and one of the problems with the inheritance tax that we used to have is that... Uh, over time, inflation eroded the threshold so that um, <clears throat> uh, instead of applying perhaps to the top one or two percent of wealth owners, uh, <clears throat> it applied to a very large proportion of the estates. Um, <clears throat> from memory, I, I think uh, the Asprey Committee reporting on the Whitlam said that it was um the threshold was something like twenty thousand dollars at the time uh which is probably you know around 150 but but not only was it getting a bit low but also it had no integrity uh all the deals done for the country party meant that um you know if you could disguise uh, your affairs as a uh, farmer, landowner, you got away with blue murder, um, <clears throat> passing uh, your property on to uh, surviving family members. So um, we have a few questions about superannuation. Um, is uh, worry um boardman here would you like to ask your question well i'll ask his question then do superannuation investments count as capital gain uh, maybe they therefore i ask about our super system as an obstacle to taxing wealth Um, I'm pretty sure the way the APS figures are compiled, uh, super is treated as part of um, a household income. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but yeah, and look, um, I'm glad you mentioned super because super is one of those areas where the rich have really rorted things. Now, the governments, both persuasions actually, uh, have tried to rein things in a bit. Um, but, you know, you can look up the tax office figures and there are uh, admittedly just a handful, but super funds self-managed super funds with assets of over 100 million. Now, the thing about self-managed super funds is that you've only got four members at maximum. So uh, these funds with getting tax breaks and valued over $100 million, uh, that represents at least 25 million per individual. So, you know, uh, the, the rorting of the tax system, of the super tax system, is something that just had to happen. And it has a little bit. Uh, but, you know, it's slicing a little bit of the salami off at a time. 
Yeah, if I can add to what Dave said, I mean, the, really the superannuation system is supposed to be first and foremost about providing adequate retirement incomes. Uh, very rich people are using it as a place to park their assets in order to uh, uh, minimise the taxation that they have to pay. Uh, because uh, Peter Costello, when a treasurer in the Howard government, uh, removed any taxation on incomes uh, uh, drawn out of superannuation. I mean, it's just uh, uh, absolute uh, golden opportunity for people with uh, fabulous reserves of wealth to to park it in superannuation funds and receive the tax benefits. Uh, certainly, a review of that is long overdue. And I, I think Jim Chalmers has indicated a willingness to get into this space by saying, well, where, where the superannuation balance is in excess of uh, $3 million, then that's clearly uh, nothing to do with generating an adequate retirement income. And uh, we may well re reduce the um, extent of exemption from taxation. Uh, I think it's more or less committed already to doing it in a second term of uh, government. Um, Miguel, would you like to ask your question? Actually, you have a few, so you can pick one. Uh, thanks, Fernando. Sorry, I had too many. Um, <laughs> oh, now I have to choose which one. Um, <laughs> I, I'll go for the behavioural economics one. So I never hear discussed in debates about tax, taxation what we can learn from behavioural economics. So I, I, I understand, I believe in what you guys are saying, we need to somehow tax the capital gains, but it seems to me that one of the problems with capital gains tax is that Behavioural economics tells us that people are loss averse. So once they've got something, they don't want to lose it more than they are worried about not gaining it in the first place. So mm. the capital gains in that sense, it seems a bad design because we're letting people accumulate this enormous capital gain over a very long time where they come to think of it as theirs. And then we say, oh, well, we're going to take some of that now. And... Yeah, I just thinking psychology is telling us that that doesn't work well. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd certainly confirm that in respect of the uh, the negative gearing. I mean, negative yeah. gearing looked at dispassionately is just a rort. I mean, uh, you know, you're allowed to offset losses on rental properties against your income from other sources. Come on, get real. I mean, there's no no inherent logic in that at all. It it yeah. doesn't. Uh, it, evidently increase the stock of rental properties that come onto the market because of this this tax rort uh, that's associated with the current negative gearing arrangement. That ought to be wound up, but we saw at that uh, 2019 election with Bill Shorten daring to put his toe in the water on this topic, uh, the, the incredible cry of rage from people who think that this sort of rort is some eternal... Uh, God-given right, uh, which is being taken away from them. So I, I, I don't think you have to go to behavioural economics yeah. or, or any theoretical yeah. textbooks just to see how well, people... I'm, I'm just thinking, it. for example, that. for example, as a taxpayer when you're earning an income, you've forgotten about five years later what you paid in tax five years ago. But people mm. that owe capital gains from something they bought 15 years ago, they'll still complain to you about it about how much they'll have to pay if they're going to sell it. So, that, yeah, that's what I was getting at. Is there some other way we can... Megan, you're... you're, you're Sorry, um... I've got a bad... Two... I've had a tooth out. That's why I'm talking. <laughs> I went had some dental work too today. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, your argument, though, about behavioural economics and um, the tax on capital gains argues for tax on an accruals basis. So if you own a rental income property, uh, then perhaps taxing the increase in its value every year. 
Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, something more yeah, like that yeah. because it's, yeah. Um, mm. Do we need it's to hard, hard to that? tax yeah. things on an accruals basis? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but uh, with a, with a low annual tax on wealth, uh, that is sort of a good compromise too. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the things about taxing wealth is that a lot of the wealth has been driven by capital gains in the past that were never taxed uh, and maybe because the, the asset value was never realised. Mm. Um, whereas a wealth tax gets at least something in annually. Um, there is a question here. I don't have the name of the person. Um, he's asking no mention of a Tobin text on money transfers. Oh, sorry? Tobin. A, to 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 a Tobin tax Tobin. is named after an American economist, a Keynesian economist named James Tobin, who uh, oh, probably three, four decades ago now advocated a small tax on international uh, transactions uh, that would be used to to fund uh, international development and also to put some grit in the grit in the wheels of the sort of international dealings uh, that, that are largely speculative. Tobin observed that you know a lot of people buying and selling currencies, engaging in international financial transactions, are engaged essentially in not in financing trade in real goods and services, but in speculating with with their surplus funds uh, uh, in order to try to make uh, speculative gains. And he thought, well, this is just stupid from a Keynesian economic point of view. We want to make sure the incentive is to put your money into production investment, not into this uh, international financial speculation. And so a little tax, he thought, would put some grit in the wheels. That was the term that was commonly used. Uh, but it depends upon all countries doing it. You know, I mean, uh, any one country doing it just simply loses their uh, appeal as a place uh, live if you're an international currency speculator. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so, I mean, the City of London would never do it. The uh, United States would never do it. And so you would never get international agreement on the imposition of a tax on these international transactions unless you could get some subset of countries that, in, in which they're, they're not major financial centres. So you rule out England, you rule out probably France, Germany, Japan, but uh, some of the mid-range countries, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you know, might form a grouping that was trying to discourage this uh, speculative processes through the imposition of, of a small tax. But it need be very small. I think Tobin suggested less than 1% on the value of the transactions incurred. Uh, I think it's a curiosity piece these days. If it was ever going to happen, it would have been happening sometime during the last four years when there's been plenty of need to control speculation. But there's, there's evidently no international appetite for it. Unfortunately. Thank you, Frank. That was just really yeah. was Frank's yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, suppose Australia did introduce one, um, and you know we could tax financial transactions dealing in the Australian dollar versus the US dollar and all this sort of thing. Yeah. But <clears throat> I can make a phone call to New York these days and say trade the Australian dollar. Yeah. And uh, there's no jurisdiction to tax that. No, no, no. Technology um, has passed it by. Yeah. What about a financial institution's tax? Like yeah, we we've are, had yeah, no financial past. institution's duty that we used to have at the state level. Sure. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. Um, uh, we had. 
We have a Jody here. Um, she actually made several questions, and I think she's gonna ask herself one here about business tax. Jody, you just have to unmute yourself. Everyone, thank you so much for the interesting conversation. Um, yeah, the, the question about uh, business tax. Uh, from what I understand, we've got a, a low rate of business tax in this country compared with um, other uh, comparable nations. So what, what, what barriers are there, do you think, in our political system to applying a, a higher business tax? And if we did that, would that have beneficial um, outcomes for low and middle income earners? Do you want to have a go at that one, Dave? Well, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I'm not sure uh, about the factual basis of, of your question. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> you'll find more, enough, more than enough people on the other side of politics pointing out that our company tax rate is fairly high relative to the rest of the world. And uh, now, an important aspect of that, of course, is that there's no evidence that Australian profits have migrated to the rest of the world where uh, company tax rates are a lot cheaper. There's a little bit uh, in tax havens. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but uh, it, it, countries that have lower taxes than us also have that problem. Yeah. Uh, so relative to the rest of the world, we don't seem to be impacted adversely by having a higher company tax rate, uh, a relatively high that is. Um, I think it should be higher because one of the tax avoidance mechanisms is disguising personal income as corporate income. So the, the top personal income tax is 47%. You incorporate and uh, the top is 30%. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I might chip in to say, Dave, again, I was quoting Paul Keating earlier, but this was another of his uh, recurrent themes that you know, there should be an alignment between the top rate of income tax yeah. and the company tax in order to prevent this shifting around between incomes and companies. Uh, so individuals and companies uh, in order to minimise taxation liabilities. Uh, so that, that seems to be a good argument. But if you, if you run that one, it means a very much higher rate of company tax, not a lower one. Uh, but then the case for a lower one is always strange because, as Dave said, you know, if you've got some tax havens with a zero uh, rate of effective tax on uh, revenues that, that are made to appear as if they come from the Cayman Islands or Vanuatu or, or wherever those havens are located, you can't compete with that. I mean, you can't compete with zero. How much lower? Yeah, right. I mean, a, a, the, the logical thing would be that becomes the standard international tax rate because we've all uh, done this race to the bottom and uh, we've foregone getting a share of company profits uh, in in our taxation revenue. So it, it's 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 frankly bizarre to uh, see much progress down that avenue. Uh, yeah. Indeed, the, the the big challenge in practice is just to the companies pay the tax because there's so much effort going into tax minimisation, uh, exploiting every possible loophole, every possible arrangement of financial affairs in order to minimise tax. Uh, governments have tried to crack down on this for years, setting up special groups to deal with so-called transfer pricing to try to prevent this process of deceit, uh, you know, continuing. But it's it's a it's a bit of a minefield, and but the effect of it is that many companies pay almost no tax at all. Um, 
So tightening down on the, the, the loopholes seems to me to be more important than fiddling around with, with the, the tax rate itself. And I'd say the same about income tax. An awful lot of income tax is foregone from households because of the various allowances, the so-called tax expenditures that, to his credit, Jim Chalmers has produced a report on showing uh, what revenues could be got by closing those loopholes without actually changing the taxation rate officially, but just closing down on all. And uh, this, this, I think, is a much more potent uh, avenue than fiddling with, with the tax rates themselves. Yeah, you, you, um, I agree wholeheartedly with, with what Frank's just said. <coughs> I've been, excuse me, following Varoufakis' tour out here, he talked about the need to tax the tech companies more. So I looked at the figures. Uh, in Australia, Apple um, declares that 5% of its sales are taxable income, and it pays the 30% on that. Globally, taxable income for Apple, according to its latest annual report, is 35% of receipts and it's only that low because Apple, one of the tech companies spends a lot on R and D. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, otherwise it'd be up around 60. Uh, so what's clearly happening is a sort of a transfer pricing where <clears throat> Apple, in this case, Apple Island licenses Apple Australia to use uh, the intellectual property, which the story is, uh, is held in by Apple Island. Uh, and this way they shift profits around. And so, you know, to that extent, um, <clears throat> uh, we should be supporting the OECD initiatives to uh, make companies more transparent and tax them more according to their global income. And, um, uh, and while there's been some initiatives in that area, I mean, the figures just scream out, there's much more to be done here. Sure. Um, Justin, Justin Matthews, uh, would you like to uh, make your question? Thanks. Yeah. Um, a lot of the reforms suggested here are often opposed based on the idea that it double taxes income previously and and therefore tax. Would uh, introducing these kinds of reforms require a philosophical departure from the taboo on double taxation? Um, probably the answer is yes, but I'm not sure that it was ever a very soundly based taboo. Uh, no. the, the, the notion that you can't tax a particular income flow more than once runs totally counter to Keynesian economics in which the central idea is of a circular flow of income. So incomes are flowing continuously through the economy. Workers get paid. They go out to the shops. They spend their money or pay for the rent, which creates an income for someone else. Then they go on and spend that, maybe investing it rather than in consumption expenditure. But so it goes. Some of it goes through banks. Some of it goes through other forms of market interactions. Uh, it's the circular flow of income that matters. And the fact that some income is taxed at one point and flows around uh, and is taxed again is part of the normal functioning of an economy. So I'm not personally too worried about the, the so-called uh, you know, basis of, of this presumption that you can't tax a, a flow of income more than once. And uh, certainly in the case of inheritance tax, you, you would be doing it, uh, no doubt about it. You know, the, um, 
the income that bought the family home uh, could be, then be taxed at the time that it's passed on to someone else. But in that case, there is a new owner, and that's often the case with the double taxation. Indeed, uh, when, it, when it relates to capital assets, it, it's normal that uh, there would be this uh, recurrent uh, tax liability every time there's, there's movement in the ownership of that asset. Um, so, uh, Don Sutherland, would you like to ask your question? You have to unmute. Yeah, thank you. My question is about um, a taxation system and productive investment. Most of the discussion so far has been about the taxation system relative to um, the distribution of wealth and so on, and not about productive capacity. The latest national accounts show a very serious continuing upward trend in the rate of exploitation of the workforce mm -hmm. and simultaneously the dramatic collapse in productive investment by Australian employers. The, uh, so my question is, what would be the most important changes to the taxation system that would enable more powerful productive investment to drive the urgent transition from fossil fuel dependency to renewables. Just one more, just one quick comment. I think there is substantial agreement in this discussion, as there is in others like it, about policy. But there is a totally inadequate discussion about the strategy that would lead to its achievement. And I think that's the big lesson that needs to be learned from the uh, shortened reforms that were attempted in 2019. There was no social movement of any power to protect the momentum of those proposals. Mm -hmm. So there's a strategy issue that goes with the policy issue. But my policy question is about productive investment. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to have a first word on that, Dave? Yeah, well, my first reaction is that the tax system's perhaps not the best place to look. Um, what's holding up uh, uh, green investment in the electricity system, for example, um, it's things like uh, people wanting to sponsor new projects are having trouble getting uh, getting access to the grid. Uh, <clears throat> they have to be able to sell to metropolitan areas or whatever. Uh, how does that come about? Um, you've got the whole system dominated by AGL, uh, Energy Australia and Origin, and uh, among other things, they're making a fortune. Um, uh, don't get me started too far, but uh, just to give you an example, um, it doesn't cost that much more to service uh, a retail customer compared with a business customer. But at the moment, uh, on average, AGL charges the retail customer twice uh, what they charge business for the same amount of electricity. Mm. But <clears throat> uh, with privatisation and fragmenting the electricity industry, uh, <clears throat> how do we now coordinate uh, investment decisions so that uh, <clears throat> XYZ company uh, that has a terrific little scheme, you know, 500 miles away from Sydney, uh, <clears throat> is able to tap into the system. Um, <clears throat> how do we finance that too? I mean, one of, one of the big problems there is... <clears throat> the the energy market is set up 
so that the idea is that you sell into the grid uh, and people buy from the grid, the retailers buy from the grid. Um, <clears throat> and there's very little scope for long-term contracts. Occasionally these do happen. Uh, the ACT government was able to do it and encourage uh, new supply of renewables. Uh, but the market isn't set up for it at the moment. And, you know, when you talk to the sponsors of these projects, uh, <clears throat> their financiers, they want contracts, uh, 10, 15 years of um, contracts with a sound purchaser. Uh, up that, nothing's going to happen. And, you know, the retailers, AGL, Origin, uh, what's the incentive for them to provide uh, these smaller companies competing in generation? Uh, what's the incentive for them to provide long-term contracts for new suppliers? Uh, so I think, you know, we have an array of incentives for R&D and other things in the tax system. Uh, but a serious change, I believe, depends on governments organising things properly and addressing those sorts of structural barriers. Mm. Yeah, to, to that, I'll just add two quick general points. One is that if, if, if this is left as a private sector challenge to increase the amount of productive investment, well, you know, it's the prevailing business culture where the problem lies. But governments could nudge along private enterprises by, for example, differentiating the tax rate on profits that are reinvested productively, low tax, uh, from profits that are used for financial ledger domain, you know, distribution as dividends to shareholders and so on. Uh, this has been done in other countries at various times in the past, although I don't think it's ever been attempted in Australia. But the second thing yes, I would say, yes. the, the, hmm. the, the, the other alternative is, uh, you know, to more emphasis on public sector, taking responsibility for productive investment directly. I mean, if we had a national investment fund set up that uh, perhaps coordinated some of the uh, the various uh, uh, superannuation schemes with other direct investments by governments into the areas where there's social need and, and ecological stress, then uh, we wouldn't have to depend upon carrots to private enterprise to, to go there. I mean, it would be a matter of national policy enacted through national investment schemes and, uh, where necessary, public enterprises. Uh, uh, I know this sounds like a rather old socialist model, but uh, I think uh, probably its time has come. Um, I, I would say there's nothing wrong with old socialist models, in my opinion. And uh, I think we could end, because unfortunately it's already 9.05, I won't be able to um, uh, go to many more questions, uh, uh, to go to more questions, but maybe we could end with an address to the uh, question that uh, was made, uh, the second part of his question, how can we get... How, what strategy can the government and the civil society use to get those changes through so that we don't fall in that trap that the negative gearing talk uh, happen? Um, and uh, because, it, you know, the, the world now of information is very confusing and it seems like the fear news, the news that put fear in people, oh, they're going to come and take some of your hard uh, earned money. Uh, that one resonates a lot quicker in people's brains than the explanation of how that's not going to, that on the overall it's going to be good and now that, how can we, how can we push those um, policies through? 
Dave? Well, <clears throat> uh, just a quick thought, but perhaps it's best to start with the spending we want. Uh, <clears throat> Frank mentioned a few things earlier. Um, <clears throat> You know, dental care under Medicare. Uh, Australia's infrastructure is appalling. Um, <clears throat> uh, direct investment into renewable energy. Uh, <clears throat> some of these issues. Now, we're all going to have different priorities. And that's a good thing. You know, we can debate. You know, should we have uh, better childcare versus better dental care or both if we can do it you know <clears throat> uh but <clears throat> but when we've got uh some of those expenditure initiatives uh popular then there's the, the debate about financing it sort of automatically follows in a way doesn't it mm -hmm. you know when you think back <clears throat> about things that Australia has done under Whitlam, uh, no-fault divorce, and the pension for single parents, uh, <clears throat> the um, uh, Medibank, later to become Medicare, uh, <clears throat> a number of other initiatives, you know, free education at the tertiary level, uh, and then we had, um, you know, the social wage on, in the Hawk period. Um, <clears throat> all those things. We put this expenditure first and <clears throat> then scratched our heads about how to pay for it. Uh, <clears throat> now, that, that's oversimplifying a lot. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, <clears throat> when the revenue need is there, uh, you know, I think that encourages people to invent things. Mm, yeah. I, I'd endorse that, although I would say that one of the uh, tricky issues analytically at this stage comes as a result of the insights from modern monetary theory. I mean, yeah, we can come up with our checklist of things that need expenditure, and as modern monetary theorists argue, uh, our ability to undertake that expenditure is not actually limited by the size of the tax revenue. I mean, it can just be done. Governments can spend without necessarily balancing budgets. Uh, there are constraints. There could be inflationary tendencies from rapid surges in public spending. There can be resource constraints if there's not the available uh, equipment, raw material, labor skills. But that's really the areas in which uh, government is constrained in achieving those broad social goals. Um, tax revenue comes into the mix as part of the story and certainly in yeah. an era where we're still living under all this mythology about the need to balance budgets or run surplus budgets, governments feel it incumbent upon themselves to somehow match the spending promises with the uh, the, 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 the revenue reforms that, that are going to pay for them, uh, although the, the payment is actually not dependent upon uh, any such matching. Uh, so, but uh, to come back to Don's bigger question, it's about politics. How do you build a public constituency that makes demands and is prepared to elect parliamentarians committed to that kind of agenda? It's one that's not just tinkering with the system, but one that's actually bringing about substantial public changes to, to make a more social society. A more equitable society, what government takes more of a lead, generates more revenue, undertakes more expenditure commitments. Uh, I, I think it sits uncomfortably in the current context, but the more the current arrangements are seen not to be working, 
the more I think the potential for building that constituency exists. At the moment, there's so much focus on housing. There's clearly a growing constituency yeah. that is demanding bigger reforms in that area. Let's have a big program of constructing social housing. And uh, that in turn, if that in turn is associated with tax reforms that get rid of rorts that benefit people who are currently enjoying extortionate rents from the strings of properties that they own, so be it. There is a lot of demand out there. And I think if we think more broadly around climate change issues, environmental issues, equity issues, the challenge for organisations like the, uh, the Fabian Society, the Everett Foundation with which I'm associated, trade unions, is to come together around these, uh, these notions to see what we can do to bring pressure to bear. Actually, having a Labour government, albeit one that's very cautious to date, is, is a great opportunity historically. I mean, we haven't had this for 10 years now. Here is the possibility of working in, with the government and bringing pressures to bear to push its policies along in those sort of directions. And knowing that Greens will be in there, uh, so too will some of the Teals with some reservations supporting these kinds of measures. Uh, so I think we, we're actually at a stage when those things seem uh, not, not you know, ready to roll, uh, the, the potential is, is indeed currently quite strong. And a thought that Frank's just given me somehow is, um, Howard used to complain all the time about the politics of envy. Now, uh, is the politics of envy a bad thing? Uh, if, if it motivates people to address inequality, um, I say that's good. Uh, if we can draw attention uh, to the rich landlords of Australia uh, ha having, you know, <clears throat> concessional capital gains tax negative gearing, all this, this is a good thing. And um, uh, the, the discontent over housing itself uh, <clears throat> by campaigning uh, <clears throat> on, on these issues may strike a chord. <clears throat> Just a thought, but uh, and the other thing that occurs to me, um, the NDIS, uh, when we think about that, a major, a major spending initiative, um, but nobody, well, not many people at the time, ever worried about the revenue. You know, there was always the thought, oh, we'll find the revenue somewhere. And certainly on the other side of politics, they never worried about stage three, the cost of that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, just a few thoughts to throw into the equation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, unfortunately, we can't uh, keep you guys here forever and I, I cannot keep it. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the discussion, and so did our our audience, our members, and I thank everyone for the participation. And now I'll let Jeff um, conclude the session. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add my thanks, of course, to Frank and uh, David. Incredibly informative, incredibly penetrating analysis, and I think I don't know what comes across to me. Is, is we really got to change our, our focus on to uh, taxing wealth. That, that really is, is wealth and rent and unearned income and so on. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's a sort of a major thing. As people just think about income, they think about tax, think about income tax. And I think, you know, you, you've really raised our um, perspective there that we really need to, I think, to look at this whole thing in a, in a slightly different way. That's in, and and the, the amount of erudition that the two of you have 
have, have brought to this has just been absolutely stunning. So, so thank you very much. Um, and, uh, and thanks to our members um, for all their um, interesting questions and comments um, in the chat. And some of them have got a chance, have had a chance to ask their question on the Zoom. That's what Fabian's is about. It's a, it's a debate. It's not, we don't come, you know, it, it's a two-way process. Um, so I think it's been a great event. Thank you to everybody. Um, if um, you want to watch this event again and any of our previous events, you can find them um, on our website under Fabian's TV. Uh, this event will get posted up, you know, in, in a little while. Um, and also on our YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, and if you do watch our videos, remember to um, like and subscribe and so on, which pushes us up the, um, the algorithm. Um, so our next event will be coming in April. We don't have an exact date yet. Uh, that we'll, we'll be announcing it soon, and and we'll be putting a spotlight on the media. Um, so you know the media is a big topic nowadays. That there's there are disinformation wars. There's in accusations being flung around. Uh, uh, basically, it seems often that anyone you disagree with is a peddler of disinformation these days. Um, so. Uh, you know, that's all raging. And also, I think we haven't seen the kind of attacks on journalists, um, you know, that we're seeing nowadays, the, the kind of uh, th threats that are being mounted to uh, to freedom of speech. It, it's it's a massive topic. Um, and um, at this event, we, we've, we've yet to confirm speakers, but we'll be looking at the whole question of who controls our media and, and whose agenda they are actually following. Um, this is actually going to be combined with, it's going to be a Victorian event combined with our um, AGM. So <laughs> it will be um, a hybrid in-person and Zoom event, unlike this one, which is, has been pure Zoom. Um, so uh, as I said, that event will be preceded by our AGM, which um, should be fairly brief. Um, but I would like to encourage everybody, in, in all of our Victorian members that are on the call, to start thinking about uh, whether you'd like to, you know, put yourself forward to take a more active role in Fabian's, maybe join our executive. It's a fantastic team. You've seen Fernanda tonight, uh, uh, well, you've seen me, and you've seen one or two of our people uh, asking questions. But it, it's it's a great team of people. Um, to work with, I'd like to pay tribute to them. And if you'd like to be part of this whole effort of, of really trying to take forward the progressive um, debate uh, in Australia, please, please think about that. Um, also, anyone who's uh, on this corner is not yet a member of Fabians, please do join us in order to, to support us and keep us going. So um, that's um, now time to close the end of the, uh, the formal part of the evening. Um, and uh, as this is a pure Zoom meeting, there's no one here in, in person, we revert to our sort of COVID era idea of the online pub at the, the time when we were all desperate to think it's so nice to go down to the pub, but we can't. And so um, we had the online pub, which really, I'm afraid you have to go and get your own drinks and so on. If, if you've got an appetite to carry on this debate with, with colleagues and uh, and so on, and, and people that you know are like-minded people, um, go take a break, have a drink, and come back in a few minutes, and and we can continue the discussion. If there are a lot of people, we'll um, divide people up in into breakout rooms, which which are more manageable. So um, thanks very much to everybody. Good night. Well, good night for now, anyway. <laughs>